Hello, welcome everyone to Poets Corner. Uh, our live virtual reading after resuming after our summer break in July and August. I am your host, Adrian Drobnies, and joining us tonight are other Poets Corner team members, Evelyn Schofield, Schofield and um, Jillian McGuire. Um, wherever you're joining from, you're probably on unceded land. You're most likely sitting in a territory that was never signed away by the indigenous people who inhabited these lands before Europeans settled in North America. I believe it's important to acknowledge we're on unceded traditional territory. Um, and, and right now I am sitting in Vancouver, BC on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish, Musqueam and tsleil First Nations. Uh, please feel free to acknowledge wherever you are joining us from this evening. We'd also like to gratefully acknowledge at Poets Corner our support from the Canada Council for the Arts, the Writers Union of Canada and the League of Canadian Poets. Just a few housekeeping items. Um, everyone um, is requested to stay muted during the reading. We, um, for the open micers, we ask that you follow the instructions you were given and to keep your readings to three minutes or less. And uh, if you have questions for our readers tonight, uh, we'll have a discussion at the end and you can put those into the chat um, and uh, just, and also just raise your hand or, or unmute yourself when we get to that part of the evening. So we're going to start with our open mic segment and then our first feature poet will be Fred Waugh. And um, then we're going to have a short break and then we'll have um, our second feature reader, uh, Rita Wong, and a short Q&A and to wrap up. So um, let's begin with our first open mic reader to tonight is Herb Bryce. Herb, are you there? And can you please unmute yourself? Uh, I... Hi. Hi. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for the communications. <laughs> okay. Would you like to read? I would. Great. Please begin. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Could you can you start your reading, please? You're the, you're our first open mic reader tonight. Oh, oh what a surprise! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm all queued okay. up. I'm I'm trying to read off the screen, which is new to me, and uh, I hope it works. All right. So this is called "If You Could Hold the Sun" or "Midnight Thoughts," because oh. I woke up with the base of it in my head and I sat on the edge of the bed and started scribbling in my little book. So I wrote something fanciful. Well, it beats the hell out of nightmares. <laughs> so here it is. If you could hold the sun, what would you do? Would you ride sun rays? We thought about it. Would you share its heat or hoard it? Would you shine its light upon seeded fields to feed the world? If you could hug the moon, what would you whisper in his ear? Would you confide your secret fears? Would you ask for favors? Would you pray for special ways? Or would you share his moonlight to show the lost people new romances on the night after that special full moon in September? If you could dance among the stars, would you waltz away your time? 
or would you shower down upon the people shares of their light to make them twinkle? Would you ride upon the glimmer? Would you ray them all to grant their wishes? Or would you bake them their favorite dishes? If you could sing in sweet harmony with all of heaven's planets, would you join their choir? Would you spin like a top in your very own orbit? Would you conduct them to rain down upon the people charisma of their heavenly vibes to heal all wounds and make peace among all men? If you had all these dreams come true, would you believe in God or stand by science or by world by chance? For many would say that such universal harmony would make a believer out of you. For such beauty as cannot be random, surely the making of man must be a miracle, one way or another, by one means or another. And surely this must make of man a worshiper of something. Fill man with awe. What would you do? Realize his purpose? What would you do? Ask the astronaut who rode them all, who was hung in the heavens looking down. He is humble. He does not grumble. Would you recognize which is important? What would you do? And if you were invited into the galaxies, would you slide down the Milky Way? <laughs> would you enter into discussions with a big black hole? And would you then come back down to Earth and share all that you know and tell us, this outer space is filled with love. Would you come home to earth by sliding down the telescopic beam? Or would you stay aloft and hug the sun, ride its sunbeams, glow with the moon and spend eternity playing among the stars? What would you do? Thank you. Thank you so much, Herb. Um good cosmic poem for reflections on this full moon night. <laughs> um, our, our next feature reader is Robert uh, Martins. Uh, Robert, I believe you're in our audience, are you not? Yeah, uh, I'm coming through okay? You are. All right, I'm just as surprised as Herb was. <laughs> All right, um, read one brief one. It's, it's a little bit William Burroughs-ish, I think. God's Barkeep. The homeless gang was hammering at the door, yapping in four letters about a black hole in the street. But he ignored the noise, poured me another, and the beer fizzed like it wanted to be born. Yes, sir, he said, I was marooned with Crusoe. Nothing to do but scan the horizon for ghost ships. There was a depression hung gray in the air. It was humid as purgatory on a slow day. I tell you, sir, we slept on sand that sank deeper by the hour. But drink up now. Hey, we were rescued, catch and release dropped off raw in the city, anxiety, hacked the smog, sir, blazed graffiti on our very soul, sir, and the streets harder than the devil's lust. I walk with a brain limp now, knowing there's no home and nowhere to go. Well, maybe in the back room, it's quieter there. Another, sir? Here's a dark one and the beer swirled like a whirlpool convicted of sin. Yes, sir, they say that God lives back there. Well, maybe, maybe not. Someone's paying the rent, though, and that's all that matters. He paused as if to think, ponder, meditate upon the speck of dust he'd missed in cleanup. And the homeless gang, stomped through carrying a black hole on their bruised shoulders and that was the end 
Thank you. I, I think I'll, uh, one line that will stick with me particularly is about, I walk with a brain limp now. That's very, very good. Um, thank you. Um, and our last open mic reader this evening is Peter Marcus. Peter? Hi. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, poem is called Hot Topic. Climate change is a hot topic, gasping on gases that make the planet all tropic. It leaves us cold without comfort, melts the heart of the Arctic, opening the floodgates, breaching the extremities like clones of cycles that twist and turn and churn the seas. It precipitates storming the citadels of power lines while arid airs parch humus, turf and terrain, to terrorize lives, rendering livelihoods, working the lands landless. A torch is raised to forest and field, flora and fauna, firing on many fronts, no longer on the back burner. Fireflies like lightning up Lytton, which can no longer take the heat. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, th and thanks to all our open mic readers this evening. Um, I would like now to introduce our first feature reader this evening. Um, and that is Fred Waugh. Who is Fred Waugh, shown here, very well masked. And he lives in Vancouver and the West Kootenays. He was Canada's Parliamentary Poet Laureate 2011 to 2013 and made an Officer of the Order of Canada in 2013. His award winning poetry, fiction, and nonfiction include Sentence to Light which is a collaboration with very visual artists, Is a Door, a series of poems about hybridity, and Scree, the collected earlier poems, 1962 to 1991. He collaborated with our other feature reader this evening, Rita Wong on Beholden, a poem as long as a river in 2018. Hi Muckamuck, playing Chinese, an interactive poem is available online. Music at the Heart of Thinking Improvisations was published in the fall of 2020. Welcome, Fred. We are very honored to have you with us tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Adrian. Uh, I hope the tech. I hope the tech stuff's working. Okay. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna read a section from this uh, book, uh, Beholden, that uh, Rita and I worked on uh, over a, a couple of years. It's called uh, Beholden a Poem as Long as the River. And what we did was uh, we actually wrote a poem along both shores of the whole of the entire Columbia River from its origin in Canal Flats in the East Kootenays. And um, you can see there's a, <laughs> there's a line of text of both above and below the river. In any case, this was a project that came of uh, a group of us called River Relations working at, uh, out of Emily Carr University. And we wanted to look at the Columbia River, uh, Columbia River because the uh, Columbia River Treaty, I don't know if people on the coast are too aware of this, but the Columbia River Treaty is up for, uh, is up for perhaps renegotiation. And, it's, uh, and this is one of the things that we wanted to look at. Um, in any case, we worked for a couple of years uh, researching the river, traveling the river, uh, and so forth. So I'm going to just read a couple of sections of, uh, of my poem. There's two poems in there. There's Rita's poem and, and mine. And we every once in a while, the two poems cross. When you come to a bridge or something, they will cross the river. So, um, so here's a couple of sections from, from, that, from that book. Listen. On my way to get a pail of water, down by the creek, ba-dum, ba-dum, 
Columbia River Strami, its invisible Kootenai Chi path, breathing what exists through itself is called as is, meaning going to the water. Here's the cadence as a wet prelude to Pacifica meanders slow and murmurs love. Someone's village has become mud lake, bull trouts waiting for some silt-free water. How are you, blue camas, shaken in the dust? Just call the wetland back, find a river you can trust. Where are you, duckweed? You can't grow here anymore. The sloughs are gone, the birds have disappeared, saying goodbye to the cottonwood snow. The shore is sad and silent. Many dreams drowned in this reservoir. Using water this way is violent. What hap what's happened to the kokanee? The spawning channels flooded. Now the river is just a mirror of how our greed's cold-blooded. These arrow lakes filled up and up and killed the estuaries of the creeks. Flooded fields of grass and drowned the orchards, submerged ancestral Sinaik's graves. Those people in the way declared extinct. It's true. Oats got swamped, old family farms, old game trails, just a memory silted now and dried to dust at drawdown. Shelter Bay, no shelter after all. This valley could be filled with love. Oh, lonely animal eyes at Caribou Point blown up for a new road. So sing the blues to be this river washed in misery, loss and sadness, not breathing deep, just silent nights alone. How much you'll miss the touch of salmon red and sedge grass edge, the churning of the minto up to Arrowhead, and then the burning too. Yeah, ain't this dam messed up your plan to keep this spirit flowing with respect. Will the riparian ever be repaired? Will the salmon ever return? As the river taught us nothing, when will we ever learn? I should have contextualized that a little bit. The, 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 the Columbia River uh, is involved with a lot of uh, dislocation, particularly on the Arrow Lakes where it dislocated about 500 people who lived in villages along the lake. And uh, the government basically just kicked them out. And um, so most of the river is actually, uh, particularly in Canada, is just a reservoir. It's, they're not like, I live on Kootenai Lake, but it's basically just a, a big reservoir for uh, holding water back to provide power uh, <laughs> to, the, uh, uh, to the states. Um, I'm going to just read the, I'm just going to read the last little section of the, of the book, uh, where we, where we end, uh, uh, where it ends. I'm feel, I feel I'm lucky, even grateful to have listened hard to the river's voice, but sometimes it's just those gulls or children screaming from the greed of Fork Tongue Point. Not the voice of the river that moaned Cape Disappointment in 1788 when the river sang clear shining water. Those Europeans could have heard its visionary recital that this river is the way home, the return to what we have left. That this is the place where I come from. I was on my way to get a pail of water. Down by the creek, I heard a hum. Badum, 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 badum. Hello, ocean, river's mouth. Thanks for listening to this stream of words become the surf. And now the river's voice is free to roar within the sound of silence. Anyway, if you're uh, interested, it was a fascinating collaborative project with Rita and uh, the book that uh, Talon Books produced uh, with drawings by our, uh, one of the other members of our group, Nick Conbear, uh, is really quite beautiful. Um, really encourage you to have a look at it. So. I'm going to go on and read. I've, uh, that was that book came out a couple of years ago now, and uh, last fall, uh, this book of mine, "Music at the Heart of Thinking," uh, came out from Talon Books. So I'm going to read a little bit, uh, a, a little bit from that. Let's see where where are we here? The music at the heart of thinking is a lot of it is. Um, it's, it's called improvisations. And I'm really interested in the whole notion of, uh, I was trained as a musician before I was ever, I ever got interested in, uh, in, in, in uh, poetry or in writing poetry. But uh, I, I feel that when I'm involved in, with composing and poetry, I'm, I'm, I'm in, 
really involved with composing music. That's how I feel about it. So I play, I try to play a lot with different forms of language and uh, a lot of the book is just are prose poems. And uh, although most of the ones I'm gonna read tonight aren't, <laughs> but uh, some of them are. This is called, <clears throat> Well, and a lot, and I should say that uh, all of the texts in the book are responses to uh, other texts, other other writing, uh, art, and and music. So it's a kind of it's a way to uh, think critically for me as a as an art, as a poet to think critically about what I'm reading. I think you'll get you'll get some of the connections, but I'll remind you about them. This is called Medallions of Belief. Stranger music copyrights end of the band that wanders through the cars FM under an on the on the move cloudy foothill sky. Austrinenye. The future torture servants have the code. The black man's gone. There'll be no more dirty dancing. Sunday school wasn't enough. That Italian suit you wear has pockets full of snuff. All those if you don'ts they warned might still be sudden summer storms. And if you are that stony stone that thinks it gets to watch the show alone, then go to Granny's house and dial a distant prairie station. Emblematic parachutes of a world, free floating in that old eternal breeze, the compact disc of Western sieve and meaning somewhere in the American Southwest between Santa Fe and Placidas, say, maybe somewhere outside of Tucson, the enemy friend holds up but we never get a song about the Toyota Land Cruiser. Instead, the train and Lily Marlene plot the transit days and access through Berlin, no bumper shoot required. We only seek to adjust our birthmarks to the modulations of poetic order and disaster, period, of revenge for skin and signal haze. Bring back the birch, little Sparta. Sing that anthem. Could my ang be my ang? New government. New syntax, brawl not, the tactic of parenthesis, fence and gate. Uh, the, I just, let's see, the, uh, this next uh, series I'm gonna read, I'll just read the notes to it at the back, the back of the book to explain the context. Um, this is a series of uh, what I call transcreations. Uh, of a Fernanda Pessoa text I came across in a bookstore in Lisbon. And I used, uh, I used Pessoa's poems, his, his, his own text uh, to talk. I actually used them in, a, in, a, in, a, in an academic paper I was giving, but I, what, I did to, what I did with the poems is I played with, because I don't know Portuguese and I didn't, don't, uh, uh, they, they have to be, they can't be translations there one step past that, they're transcreations and in that sense, a kind of a fictional translation. Turn left wing, Albuquerque. You are the key, the prize too. Too many letters for Scrabble, but your eyes are tired from staring away the, from the sea. You can't see the trees for the desert. Think about it, death's not a question. Trade empire for another wing. You're so powerful, you do not want the under. That would be meaning. Turn down that road and don't step on the grass and don't fly away angry. Person one, quest or guest, shadow or meadow, emblem or blaming, fog for an hour, myth or message, sphingical or chilling effects, her stare hysterical, remembering the future, heteronym or a British Columbian, fatal or fade out, agonize or Greek eyes, persuade or pout, crest or wave, shield or shied, pretending or defending, motto or lotto, ocean to ocean. Person Dom. Midnight. Can't sleep, so writing you this letter in which I plant my love. Familiar murmur, but you can't hear the silence. The words rumor the harvest of pines, nation locked out by the beetle. The song of our lake is so pure, we can drink it. Ocean of us. 
talk of forest and tides, distances older, but knowing no better. Still in love, wanting that good song to be sung, aiming it ahead into the dark beyond the high beam, hoping. And uh, this one's called Ode to Castles Out. The face that stares a coat spelled out. The oriental accident just fits a better country. Rampant told the lion and the unicorn to go out on a limb and hold a coat of arms out at the elbows, a river of, out of wandering. At first it is a useful coat out of sun, snow, rain, and prairie wind as tidy as England's ponds in fashion, among us roasting maple leaves and thistles. It fits, coming from the sulfur of Saskatchewan out west, step off the edge. This rope is just the ribbon of desire. And this one's called uh, a vanished nocturne. A headache, ghost pilings no longer log booms in sight. That beautiful white dog of the night, just a casino of stars. How to arrive deep into this remark, old sketch erased between Sundays, mostly rain. But this is the skin of an old Europe. Soft ashes of the afternoon singing from sea to sea. Epitaph, here is the lie. The shore is always small and changing. The captain of contain, drunk in awe. Don't be afraid. We're mesmerized to analogy. The last one picked is highest in the tree. And, and that's the end of that little series. And I've got a couple of pieces here in this book uh, that uh, just, this, is, this one was, uh, for David McFadden, a friend of uh, another Canadian poet, a friend from Toronto, who died several years ago. Um, Top notch, how could mountain be steel town drive into adolescent transnational mimeo mind reached out through this polluted shore of the Great Lake? Who could tell such a personal story through the poem, one needs daughters even you even when you lead a gypsy life, kicking east, west, until the wee vision of Scots Canadian intention turned up as a side street hospitality that day our Volkswagen bus, bus broke down and she needed feeding. Where was the anyone of the mind then until you left town again in that high hope sonnet you could chew on? So it's kind of a run. It's kind, you know, it's kind of a, a, a I used to play jazz trumpet and I like to do uh, sort of riffs. Um, this one's for, Doug Barber, uh, a friend, uh, a poet friend in Edmonton who uh, died just uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, sadly missed. And, and Doug was, uh, besides a, a real uh, keynote in Canadian literature and particularly uh, 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 Albertan lit Alberta literature, um, he was into jazz. He had a great jazz collection and spent a lot of time Listening to uh, uh, a uh, listening to this huge collection. Anyway, this is for Doug Barber. Live is what we will do later, while we wait for the rifts to become rifts and shock us to attention. Tongue sudden soon as the chord of silent silence takes over. Is this perdido? The words just stop and your eyes glaze. Wait for the next beat, and it could end there. But then a then rolls such sweet thunder up into an arpeggio we've never heard before. Out of time only a syllabic river of sound breaking up into speech clouds. The dissonant air hypnotic. You've talked nonstop through your vision, but now you've paused on the bridge listening. Not lost at all, but listening. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to end with a... Uh, uh, a poem uh, or a selection from a recent or more recent poem. Um, I was uh, I've been I've been involved a little bit in um, um, Chinook Wawa in Chinook jargon, and I've uh, done a 
done a little work with uh, an expert in Vancouver, Jay Powell. And he's had a few, he's had courses once in a while on, uh, on Chinook Wawa. Anyway, there was a word that he, in, a, in an email that he had sent, and his, he ended his email to me with this uh, Chinook Wawa, uh, Chinook jargon, for those of you who don't know what Wawa, Wawa means, uh, with this uh, Chinook Wawa statement. Elki Nasaika Wawa wegd bambai, J. Paul says. Soon we will talk again by and by, maybe in a little while. But behind this, I was younger. I understand now half as much. Then wait, that was long ago. Time not yet verbed, understood to be natural. Eventually, I will know this elastic forest. So you say, some long time ago, even next week, I will understand the numbers and the location. And I'll go there in the story alongside the river, by and by. If it's indicative, maybe we will go in my boat. Before noon, I was younger. Now I feel strong. Just another older brother. Spelling has never had anything to do with it, or has it? There are rules which may not be easy to comprehend also. Keep it simple, row, row. If it's a canoe, remember all that talk about Northern waters? Glass, that time was glass. Paddle your own North Atlantic turbine. There was dirt, there was the earth. Deep time lurks. Ocean then was fur further, just a post office, surrounded by interior lakes Salish. I thought of it as leaning. The theory of rain bends. My bardo is post-mortem, post-modern. Another bad trip, almost a festival a regular chakamaika coming to you or at you. Good to be home again, ain't it? But in the by time coming round. Uh, the poem is actually three parts, the middle section, I'm not gonna read it, it's a little too long, but the last section of the, of the poem is um, called Two Places at Once. And it's based on a text that uh, a Vancouver photographer, Marion Penner Bancroft, worked on a number of years ago. Two places at once, Marion Penner Bancroft says. When Osprey arrived in April, the geese were in the water and shitting all over the beach. To be expected, the sticks and moss of last year's nest on the piling had been mostly kicked away by the brants using it for their spring hatch. But now getting ready for own spring breeding, the two raptors were confused about which partially ruined nest to rebuild, last year's or on a nearby piling, the one from two years ago. The notion of an unformed time through which habit can be read backwards relies on the transfiguring capacity of the mind. Something equal also poses the question, what's next? Osprey cannot but double up and bring new sticks and moth to both old nests. But there is a timing problem that then gets codified by intention. Two nests at once, an impossible stratagem for birthing and raising a couple of chicks before it's time to leave in September. Biding the time between the pilings of design and our recurring hills of sleep, all of us along the lakeshore, the birds and fish, the backhoes, the ferry and the ambulance. Keep in mind the puncta of power lines and telephone poles, the horizon and the moon. This little while is experienced as location and memory, a gift, not a clock. Caught between two nests, Osprey is betwixt and in the by and by, not oblivious to the wind talking, tugging, gathering and releasing. In this, between, in this between place, we can all witness the accumulation of presence, the braiding of seeds. The hours are not equal, the horses, the barn, et cetera, nor the nests. The two delays the one, the once. Circle over the lake, float slowly round and round, hover, turning, turning, by and by, by and by, by and by. 
Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks so much, Fred. I I love all your poetry. I love the Chinook uh, poems, and I love that you use the word verbed. I have that in one of my poems. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, that was that, that was <laughs> that was beautiful and moving and full of music. Thank you. Again. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to give you. Um, a tour to give our audience a little tour of Poets Corner and then we'll be back with um, Rita. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here to do that, uh, just to show you our website and at poetscorner.ca. And um, You can find information there about our next readings. Um, here's our current one. You can sign up for our newsletter. Um, and you can also see our weekly one minute poems. Um, and we have a, a recording every week of a poem. And uh, this week, Linda Crossfield and just you need a quick poem fix, there you, there you will have it. And you can follow us on social media there. And of course you have the chance to donate to us, uh, which we are always extremely grateful for your contributions. Um, as you know, we all went into this for the money, so. <laughs> Um, please um, help us out however you can. Um, and uh, you can just uh, click on our um, donate button, the golden donate button, and uh, or cluck on it, as Kim might say. So, um, and I would also like to let you know about next month's reading, um, which I will uh, remind you again at the end, but we will be having um, Isabella Wong next week and R.C. Uh, <clears throat> Wislowski. So please join us again next month, third Wednesdays. Okay, so our Next reader is, our next feature reader today, is um, Isabella Wong. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting a month ahead of myself here, sorry, is Rita Wong. And um, Rita is a poet scholar who has written several books of poetry. She understands indigenous lands protecting complex ecosystems as natural assets and critical infrastructure that must be cared for in order to survive the current climate crisis. Wong supports hashtag land back, spends her time supporting the tree sitters blocking the clear cut of large trees in Burnaby for the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Uh, visits the Peace Valley where she can, under attack from the Site Sea Dam with the West Moberly First Nations going to court to protect the valley, and actively supports Indigenous-led protectors of the Adadix Ferry Creek wherever, she, whenever she can. So, um, Rita, um, welcome. Thank you, uh, Adrian. Um, I'm going to try to share screen because I have some uh, images to go with what I'm reading. So just bear with me for a second and hope this works. Uh, can folks see that okay? Uh, I'm going to... Uh, there. Um, so yeah, uh, it's such a joy to read with Fred. Uh, and see your faces in the audience. Thank you everybody for coming today. Um, 
I am also on unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil uh, territory today. Um, and I have two longish pieces I'm going to read. Uh, one is called Burnaby Mountain. Um, and I'm going to attempt to pronounce the Squamish name for that area, which is Lakwai. Hang on, I'll try it again. Lakwai Wait Ten. Um, and that is actually a word that uh, refers to the arbutus tree. Um, and I've been, you know, up at Burnaby Mountain for the last three years on and off. Um, and I've been, I think, really kind of, in some ways, eaten up by the urgency of the times that we're in. And I haven't had a lot of, um, not that much capacity for poetry. Um, um, and so I think today what I'd like to do is just work through some of the things that I've been kind of mulling through and I welcome feedback or questions. Um, this is a little bit rough, um, but it's I think where I'm kind of at. And, um, you know, in some ways, some days I feel like the pipeline has kind of beaten the poetry out of me. And then I have to like, uh, you know, uh, not let that happen basically. Um, so this is uh, tentatively titled Burnaby Mountain, Laklakwaitan. Named for the peeling arbutus tree, Laklakwaitan is a place where I have seen and eaten salmon berries, thimble berries, also plum, blackberries, and more. I've even seen a coyote and once even a bobcat uh, near the Coast Salish Watch House. A 20 minute um, walk from Simon Fraser University on the east gate of the Burnaby Tank Farm on Burnaby Mountain. The Tselatuth, the people of the inlet, did their own comprehensive environmental assessment of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, which shows the risks are too great. How many oil spills, deadly heat waves, and forest fires does it take for us to make people understand this? There is no consent, there is no social license for expanding this pipeline, which condemns us to accelerating climate crisis. Hundreds of arrests, including mine, have happened, and the federal government purchased the pipeline, bailing out Kinder Morgan. The Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nations had Canada's illegitimate permits quashed by the Federal Court of Appeal in 2018. Canada threw more illegitimate permits around removed the avenue of appeal and continued colonial bullying as usual, betraying the public interest while citing so-called national interest. Well, I swear allegiance to the Coast Salish nations and my allegiance is something that cannot be purchased unlike the pipeline. Thousands of trees we needed to cool the city of Burnaby and beyond have been clear cut by the Trans Mountain Pipeline in the last two years. This is the local address for mass extinction. A pandemic came along to stop the madness and they still continue to push the pipeline, violating work safe guidelines in their haste to destroy the land. The tree that used to house a red tail hawk's nest, gone. Thousands of cedars gone in the last couple of years. Trucks taking them away, hiding the evidence of what the mountain once was. I walked outside the Burnaby Tank Terminal one morning in 2018 and found a flicker feather on the ground. By 2021, the flickers are long gone, pushed away by the din of heavy trucks and the loss of trees. The average temperature along the Trans Mountain Trail has probably increased on average by two degrees or more due to the loss of tree coverage, I estimate. Noise levels are often through the roof. The stream that used to gurgle down the mountain, swelling with rain and thinning with sun, buried in a culvert, silent as dry death. A pipeline expansion is a death trap, a one-way ticket to mass extinction and climate destabilization. I am not even exaggerating, just stating the facts. Even the Burnaby Fire Department has pointed out, in the case of an accident or explosion, residents and SFU students and faculty are in immediate peril. They jail us for protecting the land while they turn a blind eye to their violation of indigenous law and natural law. 
Natural law is the bottom line, not their imaginary profits that will never come to pass because this pipeline will become a stranded asset. In the meantime, could we save some trees? Future children will thank us for this. Environmental laws are being constantly and repeatedly violated with tiny fines for big corporations on the one hand and jail time for people trying to protect the land on the other. This is what the petro state, sorry, this is what the petro state smells like. This is the stink of reconciliation, which is actually recolonization. While I believe in the power of prayer, prayer doesn't mean that you stop trying everything else. If anything, you try all the other options even more. Social media, storytelling, tree occupation, and Adrian, I should have mentioned when you read the bio that the tree sitters were taken down uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. So those trees have been taken out very recently. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been um, pretty heartbreaking because we were actually able to stop um, them from being cut down for a few months. Um, many of you've probably heard the story, but hummingbirds nests were found in the area and they had to stop the trees from being cut uh, while the hummingbirds were nesting. Um, there's so many things that we have to try and we have to keep trying. The Trans Mountain Pipeline now has a big drill working night and day to destroy the earth. Instead of stopping the violence, Trudeau has thrown 30 million at Burnaby for a new fire hall to clean up the mess when the tank farm explodes and to buy votes in the federal election, which he won. There isn't enough money in the world to clean the Salish Sea if a tanker leaks. Just ask the folks in Alaska after the Exxon Valdez. When so-called leaders miserably fail us, we must still protect the land and stop the inferno raising pipeline expansion. Natural law is more powerful in the long run. The fires, heat waves and storms will have the last word. And I'll close with the word Natsamat, um, which is a word that basically means that we're all related, one heart, one mind, one spirit. Um, and it's one of the guiding principles at the Coast Salish Watch House. So to remember that interrelatedness, I think is, is one of the tasks at hand in this moment. And um, I thought I would share the website just in case folks are in the area. Um, even though the tree sit's been taken down, people are still trying to find other strategies um, to stop the pipeline, whether that's financial pressure or ongoing um, stoppage of work through uh, delaying people. Um, there's also court cases going on through court. Uh, Tsela Tooth Land Fonder, um, Will George was just sent or found guilty of breaking the injunction uh, last Friday, and he's facing sentencing in January. And there's a number of other cases going through the courts, uh, folks from Shrekpukmuk territory and um, also down here. So, you know, um, what I've noticed in this time, like there's a big sort of eruption of activity in 2014, and then another big eruption of activity in 2018. And, you know, these sorts of bursts of um, activity keep happening, and I, I can't quite predict when or how they come to bear, but I, I would encourage everyone to keep, uh, to not look away from the violence, to keep monitoring the situation, to speak up against it, and to imagine better alternatives. Like I will walk past the tank farm and kind of imagine what if it was a mushroom farm? What if it was, you know, uh, an experimental forest? Like what are the things we could do to actually heal the land that's been destroyed so recently? And so I think, you know, part of our work is to um, make those things not only seem desirable, but necessary and uh, unavoidable that we have to stop this thing and we have to basically keep going. Um, because you know, capitalism has done quite a trip on us, and uh, thankfully, we have uh, you know Mother Earth to keep us in check and to kind of keep us grounded. So you know, those are the territories that I live on and that I consider that I have a responsibility to um, do my best uh, to try to protect. And um, at the same time, though, I'm also connected to this larger ongoing kind of colonial project uh, up north and in other places, the extraction of, you know, old growth forests, the extraction of hydroelectric energy, and so forth, and, and fracked gas, and you name it, right? 
And so the second piece I'd like to share is called Blueberry River. And um, I've also, every time I turn on the light switch, this electricity that is helping me uh, see you and for you to see me, about a third of that electricity comes up from the Peace River up north where there've already been two dams, the um, WAC Bennett Dam and the Peace Canyon Dam. And they're trying to build this third dam on that same river called the Sightsee Dam. And you know, when Fred and I were working on Beholden, you know, I am so grateful for that time we got to spend with the river because it really gave me a lot of strength and a lot of joy. Uh, at the same time, I also have this feeling like my work as a poet is not only to mourn the dead, you know, but it's to fight like hell for the living, <laughs> you know, to borrow somebody's saying. And, and so I can't give up on that river. And, you know, I was thinking about that question of the river you can trust, Fred, and I was like, well, you know, can the rivers trust us? <laughs> um, and, you know, we have to earn their trust, I think. And so anyways, this is called Blueberry River. And it starts with a couple of quotes uh, from uh, Gerald Davis, who's an elder from the Blueberry River First Nations up in Treaty 8 territory, uh, traditional Denizah and Cree territory, um, not that far from Fort St. John. They polluted our country so bad that we cannot go out there by the creek and make tea. We cannot drink water anywhere in Northeastern Peace River. And another thing too is the berries have all disappeared. There's no berries around. The Blueberry River, they call it Blueberry River because of blueberries. So today there's nothing. Oh, I forgot to switch my slide. Um, there's a before and after picture. A blueberry is a small, sweet medicine, a humble, watery globe, so fragile and so necessary. Blueberry is also a mighty First Nation. I remember spending time along the banks of the Peace River, watching a beaver build its home, tasting the fresh, clean water of rare tufa seeps before they were destroyed by BC Hydro watching the eagles soar above us as we sang for the river's life. How long does it take for a highway to kill an ancient forest? 100, sorry, one year, 100 years, 200 years. We are learning through trial and error, mostly error. Are we learning? Cumulative impacts have taken us into climate destabilization heat waves, intensifying forest fire seasons, polluted air and poisoned water. This August, each inhale a smoky one for young lungs. Capitalism denies our reliance on the earth, refuses reciprocity, puts us on a collective death spiral, prior <clears throat> prioritizing consumption to the point of collapse. Can cumulative impacts change this trajectory can cumulative impacts restore the land's health and people's respect for the earth? If so, what would such cumulative impacts look like? Blueberry River opens a path. I am grateful for the determination and strength of the Denizah people in Northeastern so-called BC, who are holding the crown accountable for its actions. Denizah hunters, dreamers, mothers, children, elders, leaders, and healers. On June 29, 2021, the Blueberry River First Nation won an important legal uh, victory. Suffering from the cumulative impacts of oil, gas, forestry, mining, hydroelectric infrastructure, agricultural clearing, and more, Blueberry sought and received an acknowledgement that the province of BC has breached its treaty responsibilities and that it must not continue to authorize activities that breach Treaty 8. The promise of the treaty was that Denizah people would be able to continue um, their forest and river life, hunting and living with the land for as long as the sun shines, the river flows and the earth remains. Judge Emily Burke recognized that a tipping point had been reached. Denizah people can no longer practice their culture the way they used to due to widespread and intensive industrial damage to their homelands. Blueberry's reserve has been nicknamed Little Kuwait because it has been lit up and poisoned by fracking flares. 
Can Blueberry and the Peace Region be healed? First, the violence and abuse of power have to stop. Violence against the land is violence against the people. Clear-cutting trees is violent. This is a, uh, a photo I took last year um, up in the Peace Valley. This is one of hundreds, if not thousands, of clear cuts and slash piles up there. Clear-cutting trees is indiscriminate. It disrespects life. Logging can happen in a way that is selective, respectful, and sustainable. But this has not been happening in BC for the most part. What would cumulative impacts in the right direction look like? Trees are one answer, one key. Trees, their death en masse that is, connect the destruction inherent to the Trans Mountain Pipeline, the Site C Dam, Ferry Creek, the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, and other major resource extraction projects. Across BC, millions of trees that we needed to cool the climate are being cut down at the absolutely wrong moment. This is a cumulative impact and replanting them might not be enough to reverse the harm that's been inflicted. Having been killed while they were old and sustaining a complex network of life. There's no guarantee that young trees can or will survive the climate extremes we increasingly face. Still, stopping the clear cutting would be a step in the right direction. In the lengthy court case, Yahi versus British Columbia, Blueberry reminds the court of the need to leave areas fallow for rejuvenation. Areas that industry clear cut and poisoned were not quote empty or neglected. They were respected spaces given, sorry, they were respected areas given space by indigenous peoples, a practice which colonizers did not care to understand. Denizah people conducted seasonal rounds visiting different areas and taking only what they needed, generation after generation. They cared for the land. They still care for the land. I'll tell you the story of this maybe just briefly. I was up in the piece in 2015. They started cutting down trees. Uh, my friend Dorothy and I ended up participating in the ceremony for the river. And I have tried my best to live up to what that ceremony asks of us since then. Healthy hunters are the sign of a healthy land. This is a quote from the court case, the, the judge's decision. Elders spoke of the bush being their store and the wildlife their groceries. But the connection between blueberry and the animals they harvest runs deeper than sustenance. One of the most important aspects of Dana's uh, identity is the maintenance of a relationship between hunters and the spirits of the animals they hunt. Hunters dream their prey and animals willingly give themselves to hunters who uphold their responsibilities. Um, that sign that's being held, oops, the flag there is actually, it says dreamer's prophecy in there. Uh, the judge also noted that uh, the Danaza's freedom was important to them and they spoke about it regularly. The land is under siege. Biodiversity is under siege. How long does it take for a dam to kill a species? Track the caribou and find out. Trace the path of the moose that are missing in action. Families that used to rely on a dozen moose a year are now down to two, if that. Track the trout that they plan to truck past the Site C Dam and see how long that expensive, insane plan goes, uh, goes on for. Um, I've put Julian Napoleon's picture here, and that's Helen Knott. Um, from Prophet River First Nation. Uh, both of them have been very vocal in trying to oppose the dam. And uh, Julian is part of a project, it's a partnership between the West Moberly First Nation and the Soto First Nation to bring back the caribou. So they've actually uh, found this uh, way of trying to pen and take care of baby caribou so that they have a chance to grow. And they've actually been able to bring the caribou numbers up from about 16, I think, at its lowest to almost 100. Um, and so it's one of the only, it's the only successful program I know um, that has been able to bring the caribou numbers up. And they're very small numbers we're talking about. But nonetheless, um, the nations up there are doing incredible work in terms of trying to uh, keep their treaty responsibilities to the animals. Watch the eagles, necessary guides and teachers 
who are losing their nesting trees. This photo was taken by a member of the Halfway River First Nation in October last year. Um, that eagle's nest is about a thousand pounds and it is larger than those hydro workers that are removing it. Up in the Peace Valley, forests are being clear cut. The equivalent length of the, the equivalent area of the length of Vancouver to Whistler. Billions are being wasted on destroying a precious ecosystem. Wildlife refuges, sacred burial sites, rare northern wetlands, fertile farmland, and more. It is a heartbreaking mistake, one that the Denizal seers have foretold will end in failure. Two landslides have occurred near the dam site since BC Hydro started this disastrous project. When will the next landslide be? I have more faith in landslides than governments to protect us from the site sea dam. A watery globe, so fragile and so necessary. Where a blueberry grows or doesn't is an indicator of health. So is a healthy moose liver and lichen on a tree. So much subtlety in a forest, so much medicine, stupidly destroyed by brutal colonial extraction. Down in the unceded Homosquium, Skohomish, and Salatooth lands, we are connected to the Peace Valley through the previous dams built on the Peace River, providing a third of the electricity we use. This grid connects us to a history of attempted genocide, the flooding of vast areas of land, intergenerational trauma, the displacement of people and animals from their homes, the drowning and deaths of countless animals gestured, through, gestured to through a meaningless apology from BC Hydro as they prepare to flood 128 kilometers more. With a flick of a light switch, I am connected to this violent history, which I cannot change. But I can decide how I respond to this history, and I can refuse to continue its violence and injustice. We can do this by stopping the dam by recognizing how the Peace Valley in its natural state is worth more than a mercury poisoned reservoir to pump electricity at a loss, since it will never recoup the expense it will take to force the dam on a land that doesn't want it. More Denizah people will be back in court in 2022 with the West Moberly First Nations seeking to halt the Site C Dam. Cumulative impacts can and must be turned around in the right direction. I don't know if humanity has enough time to achieve this, but I do know this is what we need to do for our own humanity, even if we run out of time. To become good relatives and good ancestors, we have to stop destroying the land. We have to protect it and the watersheds, which is also to protect ourselves. This is the best solution in the climate emergency facing us. If my life could protect the Peace Valley, I would offer it. One small human life, for countless moose, elk, bears, eagles, swans, beavers, trout, marten, yarrow, birch, cottonwood, frogs, toads, grebes, yellow rails, and so much more for generation after generation in perpetuity. May my life protect the Peace Valley. I offer this prayer for its life. In the long run, the earth will have the final say. My prayer is for humans and our so-called leaders to listen to the language of the earth, to truly care for the health of her waters and to respect this land that gives us life. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, that was so powerful in every way. Um, I particularly was grateful to have the visuals with that. Um, and um, I know that um, our audience, um, I, I have a lot of questions and I'm, I'm sure our audience does too. So, um, but I, I wanted to start by asking you and Fred about Beholden. And I think if I recall correctly, there's a very large format um, installation of that piece. Am I correct about that? That it was made as one long piece somewhere? Is that right? And is that still um, possible to see? Uh, is that on display somewhere? I think it's. Uh, uh, I think it's only on display in uh, some. Some place in uh, near 
uh, in the States. Um, okay. Yeah, in one small museum right now, anyway. But there, and then there's the website where you can go. And... Yeah, it was, a, it was, it was turned, uh, Nick Conbear, the <clears throat> uh, designer, helped us turn it into a, it was a 150 foot long um, scroll, if you like, of the river, you know, horizontally. And uh, you could walk through the gallery and <laughs> read the uh, read the two poems or re read the text and look at the river. So, yeah, it was a beautiful. <clears throat> if you go online, I think Rita put the uh, uh, the website online. Uh, you can have a look at it online. Um, I. Um... You know, I, I hear in both of your poetry, there's a lot of um, environmental grief, but also, um, um, you know, that speaking the truth about the way things are, but also uh, some of the things Rita said about, you know, imagining what poetry can, poetry, one of the things poetry can do is imagine a better future and um, elicit a, um, us, you know, encourage us to fight for that, to see it and to fight for it. Um, I'm curious to hear each of you comment on how you see um, poetry, your own, and, and poetry generally as a, um, a change agent, as something that creates change in the world. And um, would you, would you um, I can start if you like, Fred, and feel free to jump in. Sure. Um, I, I wanted to just pick up on what you mentioned about ecological grief. Uh, I put a link in the chat. Um, there's a woman on the East Coast, Ashley Consolo, who's been doing a lot of work around it. And I think it's really important to speak and voice what we feel. I think um, suppressing it is actually more harmful to us than sharing it. So, like, there's sort of um, the need to speak uh, in some way, shape or form, whether or not you're heard is another question. Um, and then, um, you know, to figure out how to do something or act, right? And that could be a song, that could be a rally, that could be spending time in jail. Like there's no end to all the things that we could be doing, you know, but to move that energy of grief out of your body and somewhere else where it needs to go, you know? Um, so I think that, you know, there is a role, obviously, for poetry in this moment, um, but I also believe that poetry by itself is not going to do the trick and that we need to be doing so many more things um, and really kind of going beyond our comfort zones uh, in this time that we have. Um, yeah, th those are my initial thoughts in response to your question, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh... I find... Uh, um... I agree. I agree with Rita that poetry is not probably going to do the trick, but it's uh, poetry is uh, poetry is language, and just working working in language, I find that uh, in terms of our dreams and our imagination, that I can discover things through language that I wouldn't otherwise, I think, have discovered. So, uh, for me. Poetry feeds my feeds the imagination and feeds my uh, feeds a lot of my heart and my desire and my um, my body. Um, <clears throat> so you know, for example, Rita, Rita was talking about trees, and it's always we we seem to always come back to trees and water and uh, uh, and stone and animals and you know the the things of the earth and. Uh, um, that's one of the first things that I, you know, growing up in the Kootenays, and uh, that was one of the first things my poetry uh, kind of found its way into, was trying to talk with the trees, trying to talk to the trees and uh, find a language that I felt could be, could generate some, not necessarily uh, empathy, but connection, okay? It's, it's, uh, it's using language to hug the tree, I guess, uh, if you want to look at it that way, so. 
I, I find that so interesting to talk about um, language and connection with the visceral, the physical, how it can establish that connection. So, um, and how important that is in um, um, causing us to live in a decent way, I think. Um, I, um, I want to give the uh, members of our community here a chance to speak. I have other questions, but um, uh, is, is someone in the audience today have a question, a comment? Um, please speak up if you do. Hi, I have a, a comment and question. And first of all, thank you, Rita and Fred. That was so beautiful and so wonderful. Thanks, and the community here come together around these important themes. I had the pleasure of TAing for Steve Collis at SFU, and we looked at Rita's poem, Prison Candy, which is kind of about being at the Alouette um, Correctional Facility or whatever it's called. And I can tell you, that for 20 year old, 20 year old, 21 year olds, um, these first year students at um, SFU to read this poem was so important and impactful for them. And for Stephen to say, oh, you know, here's my friend who was in, you know, in jail for this in environmental action. And then for the students to read that and then see all of this, it really does shift kind of how they are thinking about things and how they think about um, what can be done. And also the very poem itself, looking at um, the sisterhood in that poem, we talk about the sisterhood and that community that, um, that you witnessed there was so powerful. Um, I, have, um, I have a question for both of you on about language um, on two different fronts. Um, I'm curious to know how you have experienced working with different languages, working different languages into poetry into into your poetry and I think that's in Beholden there's um well, Fred you had mentioned Chinook and how that kind of comes in and I believe there are other kind of languages and I'd um I'd be curious to know how you find drawing from kind of other languages uh, informs your poetry um both in terms of the inspiration and also the the political dimension to that and um yeah, that's that's my question. Well, I think in terms in terms of the Chinook, I uh, there's a kind of historical uh, uh, connection there. My grandfather, who uh, immigrated to Canada in uh, 1890, and uh, uh, and he was a Chinook speaker. He could he, he used it, and he he spoke with other. Uh, uh, elderly Chinese and, uh, uh, and, and indigenous people with, uh, by using Chinook jargon. But it was, it's always quite common to him and I never knew what it was. I was always kind of, kind of uh, it was a mystery to me what this, what he was speaking. I thought it was Chinese, but I thought, you know, I, you know, I was told, my, my dad told me it wasn't. And, uh, anyway, and I much later found out, it, I, you know, I got into linguistics myself and I started and <clears throat> not, not foreign languages, but the study of, of language and uh, jargon. <clears throat> jargon is one of those sites in language that uh, is interesting because it uh, it is it's between it's it's sort of the it's between two cultures usually it's between two two or three languages and uh, um, so and I'm very interested in that notion of betweenness and what's between different different uh, sites of culture and, and, and being. So Chinook jargon was, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, not just a historical event to look into, but it's also, um, it's, it's, it's got music, it's got, uh, it's, got, uh, it's got a narrative of its own, like there are stories in Chinook jargon that aren't, can't be told in any other way. And, uh, so it, I don't know. I find it. Uh, I find it quite quite exciting. I know that uh, there's uh, uh, there are some people who uh, feel that uh, Chinook jargon should be the official language of British Columbia. So I'm I'm all for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I, uh, thanks for sharing that earlier uh, story, Kevin. I had no idea, so I'm glad. Uh, I, I put a link in the uh, chat to an article I wrote about my prison time, which has the poem in it for anybody who's curious. Um, and yeah, just to maybe think about, like my first language was actually not English. It was Cantonese. That was what my parents spoke with me. And uh, my the first English word I actually remember learning was the word no. And my parents taught it to me to try to protect me if like strangers came and tried to take me away, that that was the word I was to say to them. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think I don't speak Cantonese at the level I would like to, but it is the language that I feel like very comfortable in, that I, you know, um, feel like bodily kind of um, connection to. And, um, you know, I think I would love to learn Hankaminam. Um, and I think there's so much that's held in a language, so much it can teach you, right? Like, I don't speak Hankaminam. I haven't had time to take Hankaminam lessons at UBC, but my understanding of that language is that the verbs change depending on where you're standing in relationship to the water. So if the water's ahead of you or behind you, if it's downstream or upstream, like that's all caught in the language. And so to be in a language where you always know where you're standing is, is really an interesting idea to me, as opposed to, I could say this sentence to you in Tokyo, I could say it here, my verbs don't change. Um, and there's a kind of disconnection to that, I think, if you're not that attentive to the location where you are. Um, and the flow of the water and all of those things. Um, so I think, you know, if I had, if I get the chance to retire peacefully and have time to take classes in another language, I will, you know, I would like to learn Hagaminam. Uh, in the meantime, Chinook will do though, Fred. <laughs> yeah, I'm with it. <laughs> um, I think Chinook is a great language. Um, and it's got a vocabulary that is so also, Vancouver water, waterfront at the turn of the last century. Uh, I, I just love, well, Real Red Lillard started working on a dictionary and Terry Glavin finished it. And that's, that's quite a charming little book, that one. Right. You know, I always think if you have spent any time or grown up near the water, you're always somehow aware of your relationship to that, how far it is, how, which direction it is. Um, we have a question from um, uh, one of our poets team members, Jillian McGuire. Um, Jillian, could you? Yeah, I was actually just going to ask um, where we could find uh, Rita's writing about prison, and she posted it in the chat. So thank you, Rita. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you, you both. I, I yeah, I really do, do think that um, art is really, really important in terms of reflecting where we are morally and and helping us to move forward so thank you so much i think that was a super important reading yeah so i thank you and uh i i teach high school rita and i will share your writing with the with the students and um it's beautiful thank you thanks jenny i i wanted to say i wrote the article because i wanted people to know that going to jail was not the worst thing that could happen to you uh, there's worse things <laughs> than that, uh, like climate disaster. I think that is a scary enough uh, thing that we need to take it way more seriously than we're taking it um, collectively as a culture, right? Um, and so, you know, what I briefly, what I experienced in prison was people who were in poverty, in trauma, in addictions, you know, who need help. And prison's not necessarily the place to get that help. So, you know, there's a long story behind that, but I, I found that the women in the jail were actually very uh, kind to me. Like everybody in jail from the staff to the prisoners were like, you shouldn't be in here, you know, <laughs> like, um, and I'm like, you know, well, this tells us something about the laws, you know, and interestingly enough, you know, um, I get to come in and go out and I get there and the prison has a library. And what do I find in the library? My first book of poetry. <laughs> It was like this old friend in the in the prison waiting for me to show up. It was like the funniest thing. Yeah. Hmm. Well, anyway, thank you for uh, thank you for your service. And and yeah. thank you for um, thank you for your activism and and most of all uh, tonight, particularly thank you for your poetry. I think this is a, a good place for us to end this evening. Um, and. Uh, Please join us next month 
and we'll hear from Marcy Wislowski and Isabella Wanyan. And uh, again, deep gratitude to our feature poets tonight, um, our open mic readers, and everyone attending here. So, thanks night. for listening, everyone. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Adrian, for arranging this. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Adrian. Bye, Evelyn.